Today we're going to be talking about serial killers. Um, okay. What is a serial killer? Do you have any idea? Uh, a killer has a pattern of murders for some purpose. Well, a serial killer is actually an individual that kills two or more people with a cooling off period in between murders. Okay. okay. Now, interestingly enough, there is a difference between the mass murderer and the spree killer and the serial killer. The mass murderer is one that goes into a building and shoots up everyone and kills them. Okay. One incident, several victims. There has to be more than four for it to be a mass murderer. Hmm. While a spree killer is one that goes from one location to kill someone, and then without a cooling off period, goes to the second location and kills someone, and then a third location. A good uh, example of that would be the DC sniper. He was a spree killer because he did not have a cooling off period in between. Now, <clears throat> interesting enough, we always want to know what the cause of a serial killer is. And <clears throat> it's biological, social, and psychological in nature. Hmm. This means that it is passed down generationally. Ooh. It is through our upbringing or lack of upbringing, and is also a result of our wiring. Huh. So, Biologically, if you uh, come on in, come on in. Oh, uh -uh. Uh -uh. I'm looking for something else. Okay. Thank you. Um, biologically, that means that it can be passed down from your father or from your mother. Socially, it could be how you interact. It could be child abuse. Um, it can be how parent, how your parent, how your parenting is, be it good or bad. And of course, it can be the result of brain injury. Now, to actually have all of these three to occur at once, you have to hit the serial killer lock-o. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay. Not a good thing. No. So most people who have bad parents, okay, hello. Hello. most people who have bad parents, um, they're not going to become serial killers. Most people who um, whose father was maybe a murderer, they're not going to become a murderer. And most people who um, or have brain trauma, they're not gonna become a murderer either. It's when all these three things collide, that's when you get a serial killer. Hmm. Now, typically when you watch shows like CSI, um, Criminal Minds, they're always gonna to talk to you about the race of the serial killer. Serial killers are not limited by race, gender, age, location, they are just as multifaceted as the American population. You have African-American serial killers, Hispanic serial killers, Asian serial killers, women, men. They're not all just gonna be white male. Which is very interesting because the first thing you hear on, well, we're expecting it's gonna be a white male, age 35, and he's gonna, that's what they're gonna tell you on. Oh uh, yeah, they The mentalist, that. that's what they're gonna tell you on Criminal Minds. And that's how it used to be. But the patterns are changing. They're starting to understand more about serial killers and that that isn't the case. They're misidentifying them maybe because they're assuming? Or was it that it's actually changing with the culture? A little bit of both. In the sense of, there's always been evidence of serial killers in the other races. What's happening now is that through technology, and jurisdictions actually working together, they're able to gather more information okay. and able to pull all those clues together more. Okay. So it's not as easy to kill people now as it was, say, 40 years ago. Okay. Now, let's deal with the cycle of violence. Have either of you ever heard of the cycle of violence? Okay. Have you ever had a hankering for a piece of chocolate? <laughs> I love yeah. chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so first it starts in your mind, Hmm, I really want a piece of chocolate. That's the first thing. You think, that's your thought. Chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. Oh, the taste of that chocolate's gonna be so great. Where can I get some chocolate? Chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. So that's your first cycle, fantasy or craving. From there, 
we start planning. I need to go to the store <laughs> because I don't have any chocolate. So we plan. We'll put it on the shopping list, chocolate. We'll think of other ways that we might be able to satisfy that craving, chocolate chip cookies, chocolate cake, anything that might help us. And then from there, we go towards opportunity. That's when we're actually pushing our cart through the store and we actually go down that aisle. <laughs> we're getting closer and closer to getting that chocolate. Our opportunity is almost there. We buy the chocolate. We have it now in our possession. Now we can act on it. We taste it. Oh, we binge on it. And then we feel horrible about it. <laughs> Until the craving starts all over again. But the serial killer is the same thing. It first starts with them with the fantasy. How? Oh, that would be so nice for me to do A, B, C. It's right here in the mind. That's not a crime to think it. It's not a crime, of course, until they act upon it. To think it, everyone thinks crazy stuff. But And from that fantasy stage, they then start planning. This is when they get the chains for their dungeon. When they sharpen their knives when they start patrolling the area, looking for someone, they're planning. And from planning, we then go to opportunity. This is when they're in the parking lot, watching the woman leave Target, who's not paying attention to her surroundings while she's on the phone. She's distracted, great opportunity. No one's paying attention. Maybe she parked where there's no lighting, opportunity. So, he takes the opportunity and he snatches her. And that's then the violent act that he begins. The violent act, he then sees that through whatever kind of method he then decides upon. And when he's done, he's on this high. Oh my gosh, I'm God. That's what some of them will believe. Or they will say, I really shouldn't have done that. You know, there's this monster in me. Oh. And so you have this, then this self-depreciation that they go through until that craving rises up again. And then they just keep repeating the cycle. Now, in between the actual act and self-depreciation is the cooling down period. The cooling down period can be days, months, weeks, years. A serial killer doesn't have to say, well, I killed someone last Friday. So for me to keep my definition, I have to wait. <laughs> you know, instead, it, sometimes it depends on their triggering. What made them actually do it the first time? Was it their wife yelling at them? I'm partial here. I refer to serial killers as men. I'm sorry. <laughs> was it their wives bickering at them? Was it a hard day at work? Um, was it them feeling belittled? Those are all things that could trigger that action for them to jump into their fantasy. Because even the healthy human will jump into their fantasy world when things are too much, when they need reprieve. Authors, of course, we call that creativity. <laughs> Others, um, it will all just depend. But once it goes into that planning stage, that's when it gets really, really dangerous. Because you know that they're actually going to do something. When they're starting to buy chains and ropes and, and things of that nature, it's not too long before they act, actually act upon their craving. So that circle. So we have fantasy. Planning, opportunity, action, self-depreciation, and then the cycle repeats. Okay, serial killer motives. Any idea? What do you think are serial killer motives? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> to them it does, yeah. that's for sure. Interesting enough, it doesn't matter if the police understand their motive. Well, true. It if, doesn't matter. Um, anyone else understands their motive except them. For them, it can be, I don't know, um, when they were younger, they had a pet cockroach and their mother squished it. It can be something as crazy as that, that she took away their most precious thing, and so he hates women. It could be him actually just drawing on anything, any, any idea to say, well, I have to overcome that. But that's not all. 
there can also be one motive, and there could be a million and one. He can take all the crap from all his days on lot of life, and from that actually create a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle of motives or explain why he's doing what he's doing. It doesn't necessarily just have to be one motive. There can be several. Okay, our first motive is anger. Just like I said with the cockroach example. His mother stepped on his favorite cockroach. <laughs> his, his pet bug, we'll call it pet bug. And that angered him. So he has this anger that he wants to take out. So for that reason, he hates women. So he goes and he kills women. Anger. This can also include racism. Um, this can include uh, hatred of religious organizations. Um, he could feel that his job was taken by an immigrant. So he hates immigrants and decides to kill them. Um, the next one is what most people don't consider to be serial killers, criminal enterprise. These are serial killers that are usually what we call gangbangers. These are the ones that are killing um, for territory, for reputation. That's their game. It's in hopes of benefiting through the community of drugs, violence. Because remember, the definition of a serial killer is an individual that kills two or more people with a cooling off phase. It does not have to necessarily be a monster. It can also just be a regular gangbanger. Okay, the next one we have is for financial gain. This one is known as the Black Widow. The woman who falls in love with the billionaire and decides that she needs money. He has a life insurance policy. And when he dies, she gets everything he has. So she kills him. The Black Widow and women in general, they usually kill by poison. They're not as hands-on as men. And so once she runs through his money, she's then still looking for that second opportunity because she knows that she's gonna run out of money soon. So she finds someone else. And when she runs out of money, she'll do the same thing to him. And that cycle will continue. She is motivated by cash. Okay, the next one is ideology. This is the individual who kills um, basically, I like to say based on religious ideology. They don't, they believe that they are doing God's will by being his angel on earth. In the sense of they interpret their religious doctrine or, or scripture in order to satisfy that need of saying, well, since this person is not agreeing with A of my religious um, doctrine or theories, um, then that makes it that I can go ahead and kill them for it and I'm right. Next we have the power or the thrill killing. These are the people with the God complex, the narcissists. These are the people who are usually belittled during the day, who feel um, that they have no power, no control. And so in order to feel like they have some control of something, they decide to kill. They feel that during that last moment, that last breath, that they are then completely in control. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. You can join us if you like. Oh, uh, no, no, thank you. Okay. Um, sorry about that. And that's one of the, the bigger issues that we have. Um, I'm trying to think of a great example. You see more of the um, that type of serial killer in fiction than actually in real life. The most of the real life ones are sexually related, and that means that they're killing based on sexual desires, which is the next one as well. Um, they're killing to actually get off on it. Um, you have um, the Black Widow. You have also the, the Power and Thrill Killer. Um, the last one that we, well, the next one we have is mental illness. Now, mental illness is a very tricky one. It's something that every serial killer would plead to when they go to court. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, in Virginia, I don't know if you actually know this or not, um, even if you plead insanity, that does not necessarily mean that you get to walk free. In Virginia, when you plead insanity and that you're actually found to be incompetent, you will go to the mental hospital for six months. And after six months time, they will then reevaluate you. 
and they'll keep doing that until they find you competent. If they should ever find you competent, you will then uh, still stand trial. So, if you happen to be sane when you go to the mental hospital, <laughs> by the time you leave, you will not be. Yeah, probably not. No. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, I don't think that's necessarily uh, something you want to think about. It. And last um, um, popular motive is availability. They kill because they can. Hmm. That's such a strange mindset. Well, here's a joke that I heard from one of my lawyer friends. Why did the lady kill the man that appeared at, well, no, why did the lady uh, kill a man um, and then go to his funeral? <laughs> because at the last funeral she killed someone, she met a guy there, and she was hoping he'd return. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Supposedly, this is the test of a psychopath. If you would have actually been able to solve that, we would have needed to be tested. <laughs> okay, serial killers and myths. We've already covered um, a couple of these. <clears throat> but the first one is that serial killers are dysfunctional loners. Hmm. Well, uh... Can you pick up the red card next to you, Denise? The red card? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Each of the chairs here have a white card. White or yellow card. Okay? So, if you were to, if the seats were filled, we would say for you to greet the person to your left and greet the person to your right. You both can still greet each other. That's fine. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> so, just how normal you both appear. <laughs> <laughs> the person with the red card would then be the serial killer. Oh. There's one in every gathering. There's one in every gathering, potentially. Yeah. Um, they appear normal. They're not loners. They're gainfully employed. They might be the soccer coach, <laughs> the high school teacher, the pastor. Mm. They are the neighbor next door. Mm. So the image that Hollywood has presented of the guy who looks weird and who acts weird, mm. even though you should be cautious of him, you should be cautious of everybody because it could be the person that you're sitting next to that is really the serial killer in our midst. Okay, this is one we've already covered. Serial killers are all white males. Of course, we know that not to be true. Um, they're very um, racially diverse and, of course, gender both as well. Okay, serial killers travel and operate crossing state lines. Interesting enough, serial killers don't care about state lines. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> For them, it all depends on their hunting ground, where they're comfortable at. If they have the opportunity to kill someone, uh, let's say that they are, um, their killing ground is the Appalachians area, okay? Now, the Appalachians are, of course, not just in Virginia. They also go to West Virginia. So, if he's comfortable killing in the Appalachians, He's not going to worry about, ooh, I crossed the border. He's just going to go where the opportunity is. So that is one huge problem that law enforcement then has, especially if they're not exchanging information. Because these people can be operating in state, out of state. It all depends on whatever they feel comfortable with. Serial killers can't be stopped. Well, <clears throat> do you think that's true? They can't stop killing. Mm. If you believe TV, yes, they can. <laughs> well, actually, they can stop killing. That's the, the great thing about the cooling down period. Because the cooling down period can be days, weeks, months, or years. There have been serial killers that have gone several years without killing. And then something happens, that trigger event, in their lives, they might lose their job, their wife might have a baby, you know, something happens, and they have to do it all over again. So in a way they can't, as long as the trigger, if, but it depends on the trigger. It depends if on the trigger. If it's a trigger that's common, then no, but if it's a trigger that's extremely uncommon, possibly. It, possibly. 
Possibly. But they're always... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's like the alcoholic who yeah. suddenly stops drinking. Mm -hmm. Or the smoker. Or the yeah. smoker. They will always be addicted to that nicotine or that alcohol. Mm -hmm. But if they don't actually smell it, mm -hmm. or if they don't have a taste of it, they probably won't actually continue on it. Okay. Okay. Serial killers are insane geniuses. <laughs> 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 this is great because when you watch, watch Dexter, I don't know if you, anyone has ever watched Dexter, uh, he is actually an insane genius. <laughs> At least that's my opinion. Because he's able to be always one step ahead of the police because he is a police officer. <laughs> or at least a lab. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that being the case, you get the feeling that he can't be caught. Well, in this case, that is a forest fiction. Um, and a, uh, a product of the media. The media has made it possible or the thought in our head that Hey, they're, they're all geniuses out there that are killing people. Mm -hmm. Oh, if that's the case, we are all in trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, one of my slides here disappeared. Let's see if I can go back here. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, serial killers want to get caught. I've never met a criminal that wants to get caught. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> there are way too many things to do besides spend your life in jail. I've never met one. Um, that being the case, uh, I think that's just baloney. That, that's definitely a myth uh, put in place by Hollywood once again. Unless um, they have a death wish, most of them are not going to walk into the jail and say, hey, here I am, take me. Mm -hmm. I did it. Statistically seeing, these are the statistics from the 2010 FBI report regarding the homicides, okay? Now, 48% are single victim, single offender, okay? And this is for the nation, by the way, not just for Virginia. Um, you have 3% that's for multiple victim, unknown offender. You have 1% for multiple victim, multiple offenders. 6% for multiple victim single offender, 13% for single victim multiple offenders, and 29% for single victim unknown offender. The ones that I always worry about are the unknown ones. Because interestingly enough, if we have one serial killer, more than likely we have two more about to pop up. Those are the yellow cards that you guys. <laughs> so. At any time, you have 50 to 500 serial killers that can be active at one time. Mm -hmm. in, but, the in the nation. But in that, only one, less than 1% can be attributed for homicide to a serial killer. However, this must be um, taken into consideration that a lot of murders are actually unknown because of um, these people will be, will be reported missing. And if you don't find a body, you can't actually say that they've been murdered. So even though they talk about homicide with, with this graphic, uh, I would actually say that they're missing a lot just because they don't have their missing in there. Hmm. Most um, serial killers, they're looking for people that, once again, this goes into opportunity who no one's gonna miss. They're looking for the street walker, the drug um, addict, the homeless person. Those are three popular ones. So.
And then instead of having her executed, he decided to use her great talents. Okay. And she prospered under him until okay. he died. <laughs> Unfortunately, when he died, the one who took his, his place was not as, <laughs> as forgiving. And he had her raped by a giraffe and then executed. What? Good Lord. I don't know how they trained the giraffe. I really <laughs> don't want to know. But that's a, um, that was the Costa. Another very popular one is Elizabeth Bathory, also known as the Blood Countess. Mm. Have you ever heard of her? No, I love the title. Well, <laughs> she is responsible for 650 murders. Whoa. She loved to bathe in the blood of virgins because she thought that it would help her be young. Oh, dear. Because she was a Hungarian countess, this is where royalty, I guess, uh. has its benefits. She was never tried or convicted, and she was able to die a natural death. <laughs> 650, so a lot of, um, in that area, of course, you have law, the, the impaler, and everything, too. So if you're into the whole vampire thing, you could always take this as a twist, mm -hmm. because her love and lust for blood was just crazy. Hmm. Um, and in her time, she was considered to be crazy. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Considering that everybody might look a little off. Yeah. Uh, I feel sorry for the people who had to clean up after her. Just uh, tubs of blood everywhere. That bathroom. Ooh. That bathroom. I mean, seriously, tub full of blood and just let's bathe. Ooh. And you know, bathing back then wasn't popular anyway, so mm -hmm. you don't have any water. To, oh, God. Okay. What she must have felt like when she got out and walked around. Yeah. <laughs> Golly. Next we have, of course, Jack the Ripper from the 1880s London. Jack the Ripper, no one ever figured out who he was. Of course, there's a lot of um, thought that he could have been a doctor, he could have been a candlestick maker or a baker. No one really knows um, what he did um, or who he was. But he was responsible for the killing of five streetwalkers for prostitutes. And also, he spawned, or actually, if you look at fiction and books, you'll always see this connection with Jack the Ripper. Hmm. Okay, and two of the most popular in modern day, even though I could go further, closer to our time, I stayed with two that were still pretty popular. One is Jeffrey Dahmer, who was the cannibal. Um, who actually had shrines in his home of his victim's body parts to himself. And his father actually blamed himself. His father said that he, he was sorry that, his, that he was able to get out of the nightmare, but his son awakened in it. So that leads me somehow to believe that the father also had these thoughts. He just never acted on them. So you can definitely draw that conclusion there. Um, Dahmer um, killed, well, killed 17 people, but was only convicted of killing 15. Hmm. He was executed in jail by another inmate, not by the state. Hmm. Uh, the next one would be Ted Bundy. Hmm. Bundy, of course, was charismatic, supposedly good looking. Um, he had charm, he had charisma. He could lure you into a car without problem. And he also worked the suicide hotline. Mm -hmm. So, he, of course, um, he raped and murdered more than 35 women in six states. He was executed in Florida. In 1989, actually. Now let's look at serial killers in fiction. Because of... Even though murders, um, serial killer murders make up only 1% of our homic national homicide rate, we are still entertained by the idea of an anti-hero. For some it's an anti-hero, so for some it's, it's an actual villain, but we're excited by, this, by the possibility of someone coming and doing something that we can never do. Now, the connection could also be made that we're just a bloodthirsty culture. <laughs> just like it was, you know, back in Rome, um, when you had the, the animals eating the people and all that great stuff. 
However, nonetheless, the great thing about fiction is that it's just that fiction until the author actually uses um, some real life serial killer as the makeup for one of their characters. With that in mind, um, one of my favorite ones is Hannibal Lecter. Where would the genre be without <laughs> Hannibal Lecter? You can watch Silence of the Lamb, and even if you have it on mute, it will still scare you. <laughs> well, interesting enough, Buffalo Bill, who's also in there, he's the one who's making, I believe, the, the body of skin and, mm -hmm. and Silence of the Lamb, the first one. He's actually based on the serial killer, Ed Gein. Hmm. Yeah. Ed Gein um, actually helped us create a, several serial killers for fiction, including, and movies, including uh, Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was one popular one. Um, I'm trying to think. Okay, the next one we have is, of course, Dexter Morgan. And Dexter is created by Jeff Lindsay. And this is a series that has just taken off, I believe it's like six books in the series. And of course, with Showtime, the popularity is just ever increasing for him. Um, you also have Patricia Highsmith. She created Tom Ripley. Uh, Matt Damon did a movie called The Talented Mr. Ripley. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Also a serial killer. And lastly, who could ever forget Norman Bates? Oh, yeah. Mm. Psycho would not be the same if you took Norman out. <laughs> <laughs> so, what happens when you break the Ten Commandments? <laughs> That's what my book is, of course, dealing with, Thou Shall Not. Um, which takes place in Richmond. Um, it is a serial, about a serial killer that is killing according to the Ten Commandments, and he is trying to, mm, what is he trying to do? Golly. He is trying to actually find repentance. For not for his sins, but for the sins that they've created against others. So that then concludes my, my talk. Um, any questions? Were you interested in serial killers before the writing? Um, when I worked at the, I, when I was in high school, I did an internship at the Richmond Commonwealth Attorney's Office. And um, back in the 80s, there was a gang, I can't remember their name, but I got to look at their file. And I'll never forget seeing pictures of a family that had been brutally murdered and eaten by their dog. They left the dogs alive, but they killed the families in there. So they had, I think, like two Doberman pinchers, pinchers or whatever. And the dogs are left in the house with these bodies for days. And so by the time the police responded, the dogs had already eaten a lot of what was left. Hmm. That freaked me out. Mm -hmm. Completely freaked me out. I'd already, go, my high school was different. I went to a, a very different type of high school to say the least. So this was after already visiting the morgue. I, the morgue was fine, but seeing those pictures, that just did something to me. I was thinking to myself, I do not want to end up a snack <laughs> or a dopamine pincher, you know? And somewhere along the line between that and, uh, because I'm a, I'm a criminal paralegal, um, between that and my day job, it just kind of morphed. The book, um, Thou Shall Not, started out as a historical roman romance set in Scotland. It was supposed <laughs> to be nice and fuzzy and warm. <laughs> and so we moved from nice, oh, look at that ghost, oh, I love you.